Well, thank you for coming along this afternoon. Uh, I, I make no apology for taking you deep into some medieval history, but I think you're going to walk away with more about uh, medieval English history than you ever wanted to know. Um, <clears throat> but please bear with me because it's necessary to tell you the, the tale of how Magna Carta uh, came to be about and how it so very nearly failed. So the 800th anniversary of the signing of the Magna Carta falls on June the 12th. And as uh, the parties to it, King John and his barons, would have been totally astonished to be told that their agreement would echo down the centuries to the US Constitution, to the United States Bill of Rights, to the Universal Declaration of Rights adopted in 1948, and the European Convention on Human Rights adopted in 1953. Uh, they would probably have been equally astonished to be told that there was a, a lump of land across the Atlantic Ocean that they didn't know about, but that's a different story. Now, <clears throat> these are the doors, uh, the bronze doors of the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. And uh, eight panels, they indicate the roots of United States justice. And in the bottom right panel, you will see King John being confronted by one of his barons. So how on earth does King John come, from, come to be on the doors of the Supreme Court? What was the sinuous trail that led there from a meadow outside London, not far from Windsor Castle, in 1215? And how is it that in some respects it can be said that, that the United States, by attaching such major importance to individual freedoms, has actually anchored its law more firmly to Magna Carta than has modern Britain? Now, as you recall, in the years leading up to the disagreement of 1776, uh, <clears throat> there was a certain growing uh, unrest among King George III's subjects in the American colonies. Uh, among other concerns, they didn't like the taxes imposed upon them from afar. They didn't welcome the requirement to house and feed the king's soldiers <clears throat> on demand and usually without recompense. And they didn't like being told what they could or could not do from faraway London in the name of King George. Now, just 560 years earlier, in the years leading <clears throat> up to 1215, and there were similar complaints from some of the subjects of King John in England. I say some of the subjects because times were different. I ask you, would, would you buy a second-hand horse from that man? <laughs> times were, were different. They were harsh living conditions for those at the bottom, and unhappiness was doubtless experienced at all levels. But after all, those were the days of the medieval age and feudal society. <clears throat> the only opinions that mattered to the king were those of the Pope and the Catholic Church, and, of course, the squabbles of the barons and the lords of the land. In 1215, there was no such body as the Parliament for debate and decision, and the common people, that is, the serfs and the villains, were of little account. In some respects, the barons regarded many of them as little more than animals with two legs as opposed to animals with four legs. King John had many challenges on his hands. On becoming king in 1199, he had a rival for the succession, and that brought a war with King Philip II of France. And although he won that particular con confrontation, things did not go well. In 1206, war with France was renewed. And as a result, King John <coughs> lost the Duchies of Normandy and Anjou in France. He became known as John Lackland because he kept on losing land. He never in intended to inherit, inherit it, and he, and he lost it. Wars cost money, and King John levied heavy taxes on his barons. But war with France and squeezing taxes out of the barons were not his only problems. From 1208, he had a feud with Pope Innocent III, over who should become the Archbishop of Canterbury. And the Pope sent Bishop Stephen Langton to fill, the to fill the position. But King John had his own candidate, and so he banished uh, Langton from England, and he confiscated church property. And that's not a thing that the Pope took kindly to. Whereupon the Pope first issued an interdiction against the King, and then excommunicated him. Now, excommunication was serious stuff in those days as it meant that no religious services could be carried out, no church bells could be rung, 
no marriages in church or burials in consecrated ground, and worst of all for the king, it absolved the king's subjects from their oaths of allegiance, which then in turn gave license to the barons to revolt. By 1213, King John was forced to give in to the Pope's wishes and accept Langton as the Archbishop of Canterbury. The excommunication was lifted, but John, again, John once again was, by this time was at war with France. And he levied further taxes on the barons in the form of what's called scutage, which is <clears throat> if they didn't provide men and weapons, then they had to pay money uh, to the king in lieu of military service. Thus, by 1214, King John was in a rather parlous state, politically and economically. He had bad relations with the church, he had a bunch of seriously disgruntled barons over taxes, uh, and the imposition of his kingly uh, aut autocratic authority. He had the prospect of domestic revolution being stirred up by the barons amongst the common people, and the royal coffers were empty. And Obama thinks he has problems with Congress. No? In 1215, with the barons <coughs> demanding that the king give in to their grievances, the barons seized London, and the king then had no option but to accede to their demands. The first document was known as the Articles of the Barons, <clears throat> and it was the subject of negotiations in June 1215 when the two sides met in a meadow at Runnymede, not far from what is now Windsor Castle, northwest of London. And at this meeting, Archbishop of Canterbury, because he was by this time, Stephen Langton, stepped in to lead and help draft the Charter of Liberties. And this was the document, written in Latin and subsequently known as Magna Carta, which was authenticated by the attachment of the royal seal on the 15th of June, 1215. The diagram shows the king signing, but in fact, the king didn't sign Magna Carta. Uh, the authentication of uh, royal documents in those days was by the attachment of the royal seal. And there is a copy uh, of it. All 63 clauses, all written in one complete paragraph with a royal seal at the end. Copies were made for distribution throughout the kingdom, and of those four original copies still remain, all of them in England. One is kept at Lincoln Cathedral, and it was shipped to the United States for safekeeping in Fort Knox during World War II. And just a few months ago, it was shipped again uh, to the States for public exhibition in Boston, and then later at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., and also to the Clark Institute down the road in Williamstown. And some of you may have seen it there last fall. The settlement, however, agreed in Magna Carta did not last long. In fact, as we look at it 800 years later, it's a wonder it survived. In fact, the treaty was a failure, and it might well have disappeared forever. The king objected to the arrangements for enforcing the document's terms, he probably had no intention of carrying out, it carrying out anyway. And within six weeks, he sent a request to the Pope that it be annulled. Now, for his part, the Pope didn't like it either. He considered the protection of the rights of the Church as insufficient. And on principle, he didn't approve of the restrictions being placed on royal authority, even though he didn't like King John. And so on the 24th of August, that's just a few weeks later, uh, he issued a papal bull describing Magna Carta as illegal, unjust, harmful to royal rights, shameful to the English people, and he declared the charter null and void of all validity forever. And therein, it could easily have died. Once more, the barons resorted to battle with the king. They invited Prince Louis, the son of the King of France, to invade England and overthrow King John, in an effort that wasn't successful, and by this time, uh, <coughs> King John, who he was born in uh, 1166, and we're now talking about 1216, uh, England was still at war when he died of dysentery in October 1216. So King, that was the end of, of King John. Actually, <coughs> he may have been unsuccessful um, uh, with, uh, with his barons and with the Pope, but he was quite successful in other ways. He had two wives. Uh, from the second wife, he had uh, uh, two sons and three daughters. He also managed to have, uh, by various mistresses, nine illegitimate sons and three illegi illegitimate daughters. So he was quite busy uh, in other things besides. Huh? 
So written in one long piece, most of the provisions of Magna Carta address the grievances of the barons over taxes levied by the king, the king's rights over the barons, uh, widows, uh, 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 and that widows standing in the community, and practical matters such as who had the right to control the fish weirs in the River Thames. I mean, was it the kings or was it the, 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 uh, the, the, the barons? And one might have expected that this document would have died with the death of King John, but it represented the first steps in establishing the boundaries of authority between the king and his people and the entitlement of the individual to due processes of law. Various revisions were made over the ensuing 80 years. And in the centuries that followed, the great majority of its provisions were either repealed or simply became outdated. There are, in fact, three <coughs> elements of, the, of Magna Carta which are still in force today uh, in English law. Um, but some of the elements, although at first attracting little attention, have served to provide the basis of English law and, of course, American law as well. And the most celebrated clause in its English translation is this one. Of course, it starts off with the term, no free man. Well, in 1215, <clears throat> there were very few free men among the peasantry. Villains were only partially free, and serfs were not free at all. And you'll note, of course, that the term of, the, of that clause did not include women. <clears throat> Moreover, there was no clear definition of law of the land, as in 1215, there were no laws established by written statute. All there were were customs, and of course, the exercise of the king's royal power depend, depending on what he wanted to do or wanted not to do. But as years passed, succeeding generations were able to build on the provisions of this clause and interpret it for their own pur purposes. And in the 14th century, Parliament saw, Parliament was established basically um, uh, by uh, King John's uh, uh, son, King John's grandson, Edward I. Um, and uh, in the 14th century, Parliament saw the phrase lawful judgment of his equals contained in that uh, clause as a guarantee of trial by jury. And that's the first time that that occurred. Now, Magna Carta also stated that no taxes could be demanded without the, quote, the general consent of the realm, meaning, of course, the realm in those days, meaning the leading barons and churchmen, not meaning the people. But in later centuries, as the application and exercise of government developed and parliament was established and began to control national budgets and taxes, the general consent of the realm came to mean the authority of an, an elected government. Now fast forward for some 400 years. By 1600, the charter had actually been virtually forgotten. But then in 1607 or thereabouts, a clever lawyer and jurist by the name of Sir Edward Cook, which pronounced Cook, not Coke, dug it out of obscurity. Now apparently he was not only very clever, but he was also arrogant and obnoxious uh, to his peers. And indeed, after his death in 1634, his wife is reputed to have said, there'll never be the likes of him again. Praise be to God. <laughs> and as Chief Justice to King James I in 1607, he greatly annoyed the king by asserting that the common law was the supreme law and that the king in his own person cannot adjudge the case. He argued that the crucial section of Magna Carta established the precedent of limits on monarchical power, and this later became an important argument in the civil war in England in the 1640s. And this was a civil war that eventually resulted in a brief republic led by Oliver Cromwell and the beheading of King Charles I in 1649. You see on the stage there, on the, your right-hand side looking at it, uh, there is somebody holding up uh, uh, the head of King Charles. And that banqueting hall that he stepped out from uh, in order to be executed is in there in London today. Some of you may have visited it in London down White Hall. In the early 1600s, political and religious unrest in England, allied with interests in commercial investment, <coughs> saw several settlements being established across the Atlantic. 
The views of Sir Edward Cook, later Lord Cook, on the significance of Magna Carta and his legal guidance were in vogue. And he had a major hand, Cook had a major hand in writing the very first Virginia Charter, which included language guaranteeing the settlers' rights as free English subjects. And as the legal education of colonial Virginians advanced, the popular understanding of the meaning of common law rested on Cook's writings. And over 100 years later, over 100 years later, in 1763, when a young Thomas Jefferson was studying law in Williamsburg, high on his reading list were the writings of Lord Cook. Now, Virginia was not the only colony to pay attention to Magna Carta. An extract uh, from the Massachusetts Body of Liberties under Clause 29 said this, no man's life shall be taken away, no man's honor or good name be, shall be bestained, no man's person shall be arrested unless by virtue of some express law of the country. And in 1687, William Penn published in Philadelphia the first American printing of his translation of Magna Carta under the title, The Excellent Privilege of Liberty and Property. So the weighty role played by Lord Cook in the formulation of common law in England and its interpretation of the United States law is reflected again in the bronze doors of the Supreme Court. And you see <clears throat> on the right-hand side, second down, Cook and James I. Now, at this point, I'd like to take a brief diversion down a different road. Perhaps inevitably in history, there is a tendency to look at all these matters from an Anglo-centric point of view. But we should recall that originally, New York was called New Amsterdam. Henry Hudson was an experienced seafaring man, and he was quite sure that there was a way northwest through the American landmass to Asia and the Spice Islands of the East Indies. But although he was English, he couldn't find the funding to explore where he wanted. And his, instead, his English employers in 1608, who were called the Muscovy Company, they demanded that he should go northeast from England over the top of Russia. That was what, in their mind, was the road to, to the East Indies. It was at this point that Hudson was approached by the Dutch East India Company with a proposal to hire him to find a shortcut to Asia. So Hudson fitted out his ship at the cost at the expense of the Muscovy Company. He found a crew, and in 1609, he headed off northeast. And then he disobeyed his instructions, turned the ship around, uh, and went west across the Atlantic. And when he came to the east seaboard of uh, the American colonies, he explored the rivers on the east coast of this unknown territory, and he went up the river that since then has carried his name, thinking that that was going to lead him uh, to uh, his passage to the East Indies. His voyage predated the landing of the pilgrims in Boston by a whole decade. And when he returned to Amsterdam, the Dutch saw the value of establishing a small trading post at the mouth of that river. The Dutch of the early 17th century <clears throat> until the 1650s were traders. They were not colonizers. They were much more tolerant than the English. And the residents of New Amsterdam were much more cosmopolitan, much more freewheeling, independent, and commercially minded than the pious God-fearing communities established by the Pilgrim Fathers and the Puritans. And perhaps you will recall <clears throat> that in order to escape the intolerance of religious strife in England, the Pilgrim Fathers actually spent 10 years in Leiden, Holland, before leaving to cross the Atlantic in 1620. And thus it was that the Dutch established this small foothold on the island of Manhattan. And they maintained that presence until 1664, when Peter Stuyvesant surrendered to a superior English force, and in 1665, uh, it was renamed New York in honor of Prince James, the Duke of, New, uh, Duke of York, who later, in fact, became King James II. 
Now, if you wouldn't have bought a second-hand car from the first king, would you buy a new car from this gentleman? I mean, look at the expression on his face, you know? It is interesting to contemplate how matters might have turned out differently if the Dutch had been colonizers from the outset. Holland at that time was a republic, and the government left the administration of New Amsterdam and the discipline and law and order in the commercial hands of the, of the uh, Dutch West India Company, West India Company. America would doubtless still have had its revolution for independence in due course, but Dutch law has never been based on Magna Carta. King John would never have been given a place on the doors of the Supreme Court. And if, say, the Dutch had strengthened their presence and eventually expanded up and down the coast, kicked the English settlers out of Virginia, moved north and taken over the settlements in New Haven, New London, Boston, and perhaps renamed Boston New Leyden. Then things would have been very different. Dutch law would have applied, and in the 1800s, it would have been based on the Napoleonic Code, not in the kind of law that we see in American law at present. The present Dutch criminal code has no jury system, and the death penalty was abolished as long ago as 1870. If the investigation and trial of Jokar Sanyev in Boston just a few weeks ago had been according to current Dutch law, it would have been conducted very differently, and he would not have been sentenced to death. However, back to my story. <clears throat> in England, another milestone was established in 1689 with the passing by Parliament of the English Bill of Rights. The restoration of the monarchy and King Charles II uh, in, in 1660 had not actually resolved the dispute between Protestants and Catholics. And when his successor, the Duke of York, after, which, after whom New York was named, became King James II, he was a Catholic. And he proved to have designs on being an absolute monarch and the restoration of Catholicism. And this did not go down with the uh, English Parliament and the English people. He was overthrown in 1689 and replaced by a Protestant monarchy. And in so doing, however, this time Parliament sought to impose limits on the crown and assert the rights of the people as represented in Parliament. And among other provisions, the Bill of Rights stated that there should be no royal interference with the law, no taxation, by uh, royal prerogative, no royal interference in the election of members of parliament, no excessive bail or cruel and unusual punishment, and the people had the right to petition the monarch without fear of retribution. Also, one of the interesting things about this is if you look at the line right at the bottom, that the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense suitable to their conditions and as allowed by law. Catholics were not allowed uh, to have arms, uh, but one wonders whether eventually this kind of thing led to the Second Amendment. Another interesting thing <coughs> about that is that passed at this time uh, was uh, an act by which the monarch of, uh, of the UK uh, cannot marry a Catholic. Uh, there is, and that is true to this day. Uh, so, in fact, uh, there's nothing in it that says the monarch can't marry uh, a Muslim, <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, uh, this is still to this day. The Act of Union provides for the fact that the, the monarch has to be the head of the Church of England, and as such, must be a Protestant. Thus, by the 1700s, the thrust of one crucial section of Magna Carta was deeply ingrained in the mindset of lawyers and jurists on both sides of the Atlantic. And as the years passed and the colonists became increasingly unhappy with directions and strictures from London, they began to use the provisions of Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights against the English Parliament. The very terms that in London had been used by parliamentarians to reduce the powers and tie the hands of successive monarchs were now turned on the parliamentarians themselves by the American colonists. Men such as John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison became imbued with the spirit of Magna Carta and the liberties offered under common law as interpreted by Lord Cook. 
Following the costly Seven Years' War, which was 1754 to 1763, Great Britain was burdened with substantial debts and the continuing expense of keeping troops on American soil. Parliament thought the colonies should finance much of their own defense and levied the first direct tax, the Stamp Act, in 1765. And as a result, virtually every document, newspapers, licenses, insurance policies, legal writs, even playing cards, all had to carry a stamp showing that the required taxes had been paid. Now, the colonists objected to such control over their daily affairs. Their own elected legislative bodies had not been asked to consent to the Stamp Act. The colonists argued that without this, either this local consent or direct representation in Parliament, the Act was taxation without representation. And that was what uh, was the Stamp Act and the protests in the streets. I don't know who the uh, gentleman was or the dummy at the top of the uh, thing, but he was obviously not very happy. The Massachusetts Assembly, <coughs> protesting against taxation without representation, said the Stamp Act of 1765 was, quote, against Magna Carta and the natural rights of Englishmen, and therefore, according to Lord Cook, null and void, unquote. Parliament, seeing the danger, quickly rescinded the law, but the damage was done. And already the colonists resented the imposition of laws from distant England, and they objected to requirements such as the provision of lodging and food to British soldiers on demand, and the Stamp Act served as the straw that broke the camel's back. In May 1776, <clears throat> George Mason in Virginia drafted language, which with the addition of other articles was adopted unanimously on the 12th of June 1776 as the Virginia Declaration of Rights. And stemming from Magna Carta and based on the English Bill of Rights, Mason's initial draft affirmed the principle of inherent individual rights individual rights, declared that power should be invested in the people, but rejected the notion of privileged political or aristocratic classes or hereditary offices. And as adopted, the Virginia Declaration contained 16 articles in which can be seen language that later appeared in similar form in the Declaration of Independence. and I'm highlighted there in red in sections one and two, you can see how, how all this was now emerging. Uh, <coughs> uh, equally free and independent, life and liberty, pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. You can see how these words echoed in the later Declaration of Independence. And all this then brings us to the matter of the unpleasantness of 1776. <laughs> the seal adopted by Massachusetts on the eve of the revolution, summed up the mood. A militiaman with a sword in one hand and Magna Carta in the other. And at the time, the Massachusetts currency was still in shillings. And here is a slide of the 40 shilling note depicting Magna Carta and quote, as you can see over the top, issued in defense of American liberty. And as John Adams later wrote to Thomas Jefferson, the revolution was in the minds of the people, and this was effected from 1760 to 1775 in the course of 15 years before a drop of blood was shed at Lexington. And so it was that the Declaration of Independence contained the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. You can see how this is all tracked from Magna Carta in 1215. Now that declaration went on to pillory King George III for, quote, a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states, unquote. And it listed no less than 27 of King George's alleged crimes. Poor King George. For by that time, he was now a constitutional monarch, having lost many of his royal powers to rule by decree by virtue of the English Bill of Rights. <clears throat> 
which had been adopted almost 90 years earlier. And his so-called misdeeds were in fact the acts and bills passed by his ministers in Parliament. But it was the king who had signed them into law, and as we all know, the buck stops at the top. Now this is not the occasion to delve into the arguments and counter-arguments of the ten or so years that following July 1776, as various views were expressed, sometimes quite heatedly, about the form and operation of government to be adopted in the new republic. The relationships between federal and states' rights, the wording of the constitution. During that very contentious debate that took place between the delegates of the 13 states in that hot summer between May and September 1787 at the Constitutional Convention, there were times when that agreement seemed out of reach and there might, might never be a union. And once the new constitution was adopted in seven, September 1787, there was wide reluctance to open the text up again for any rewording. And so as a way to avoid reopening the text, George Mason suggested that a bill of rights should be attached to the new constitution. That, but that was objected to the ground, on the grounds that spelling out certain rights of the people would imply that any rights not specifically mentioned wouldn't exist. And among the critics were James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. And Hamilton went as far as to say this. Bills of rights are in their origin stipulation between kings and their subjects, abridgments of prerogative in favor of privilege, reservations of rights not surrendered to the prince. Such was Magna Charta, obtained by the barons sword in hand from King John. So it, didn't, it looked as though there were going to be objections to the idea of there being a, a, any kind of Bill of Rights. However, by 1789, there was a wider re recognition that the Constitution really did have several weaknesses, and it had several omissions that needed correction. And in June 1789, James Madison proposed 39 amendments to the body of the Constitution in a speech to the House of Representatives. It was a speech that might be regarded as one of the most significant and historic speeches in that body, in that it led to the adoption of the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, commonly known these days as the Bill of Rights. And of these, the first nine address individual rights, and in spirit they emanate from that one clause that I showed you earlier of, the Magna, of Magna Carta in 1215. And in his June 1789 speech, Madison pointed out that just as there was a major difference between the systems of government in Great Britain and the United States, so too there was a difference in the rights that needed to be protected. And I'll leave you just a minute to read that through, because that's really quite important. See, their Magna Carta does not contain any one provision for the security of those rights, respecting which the people of America are most alarmed. The freedom of the press and rights of conscience, those choices, privileges of the people, are unguarded in the British Constitution. And at the same time, Madison recognized that in a republic, where the role and power of a monarch was replaced by a legislature elected by the people, there could be possibilities of that legislature enacting laws that would restrict the liberties and freedoms of the people. All the more reason, therefore, that the guardianship of individual rights should be through the courts and the judiciary, rather than through the legislature as it, or the executive. Thus, his proposed amendments contain specific provisions regarding search and arrest warrants and the rights of individuals in criminal and civil cases and there are rights to a fair trial. The process of drafting, redrafting, discussion, voting in the House and the Senate, and the ratification by the states that produced the Bill of Rights was not a pretty one. In the end, after discussion, debate, and revision, the first Congress of the United States proposed 12 amendments to the Constitution, and Roger Sherman of Connecticut suggested that they should be annexed to the body rather than changing the wording of the Constitution itself. And 10 of the amendments, that's for Articles 3 to 12, were ratified by three quarters of the state legislatures in December 1791. In 1992, 
203 years after it was first proposed, Article 2, Congressional Compensation, was ratified as the 27th Amendment to the Constitution. And Article 1 of those 12, which concern the number and apportionment of US representatives, has never been ratified at all. The evolution and interpretation of rights has continued to this day. In December 1948, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Eleanor Roosevelt chaired the drafting committee, and she was the driving force behind its adoption. And so with Eleanor Roosevelt, yet again, here was an American guiding hand and stemming right back to Magna Carta. And written in the wake of the atrocities committed in World War II, its articles include language that you will certainly recognize. Now, in the preparation of this talk, I was directed to Thomas Paine and his famous publication, Common Sense and Rights of Man. Thomas Paine, born in 1737, first met Benjamin Franklin in London in 1774. He was already a sharp critic of the monarchy and government, and in Franklin, he found a kindred spirit. And on the recommendation of Franklin, Paine moved to America and arrived in Philadelphia in November of that year, 1774. His arrival coincided with the mounting rumblings for independence, and the publication of Paine's Common Sense in 1776, added fuel to a fire that was already burning when he argued that Americans should not simply object to taxation, but should demand complete independence from Great Britain. Then with the French Revolution in 1789, Paine's strong views against monarchy and aristocracy became even stronger. In a response to Edmund Burke's attack on the French Revolution, with the publication of his Reflections on the Revolution in France, Paine again leapt into print and he wrote Rights of Man. So common sense and rights of man are these two particular uh, pamphlets and publications that, uh, for which Thomas Paine is known. However, the rights he described were not those of the individual, but the rights of a people to have an elected government and led by a person from the people rather than by a government led by a hereditary monarch. And indeed, Thomas Paine was against a charter of rights, and he wrote this in The Rights of Man. It's a perversion in terms to say that a charter gives rights. It operates by contrary effect. Rights are inherently in all the inhabitants, but charters, by annulling those rights in the majority, leave the right by exclusion in the hands of a few. And you can see, if you continue reading on it, those whose rights are guaranteed by not being taken away exercise no other rights than as members of the community they are entitled to without a charter. And therefore, all charters have no other than an indirect negative operation. So the rights of man, produced by Thomas Paine, is not concerned the rights that were articulated in the Bill of Rights uh, that stemmed from the Magna Carta. In common sense, Paine railed against government by, quote, that royal brute, unquote, King George III and his arist arist aristocracy. Society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil, said Paine. Today's Tea Party would be proud of Thomas Paine. And yet he was also the Bernie Sanders of his day. He argued for state monies to be given to the poor and the aged, his support for the needy at the expense of the rich, and allowances for children's education. And while his rights of man were being written and later received with apoplectic fury by Edmund Burke and the government in England, away in America, James Madison was already putting forward his proposed amendments to the Constitution. In September 1789, 18 months before the publication of Rights of Man, Congress had already approved 12 amendments and submitted them to the states for ratification. And as I've already said, it was in December 1791 that the required ratifications to 10 of them were received, which then became the Bill of Rights. <laughs>
Thus, while Thomas Paine's forceful views in support of independence and the American and French revolutions were highly regarded in America, in practice, they had little, if any, impact on the consideration and approval of the US Bill of Rights. Which brings us back to the Supreme Court. As recently as 2010, we've seen the Citizens United decision by five to four in the Supreme Court that the First Amendment to the Constitution protects associations of people as well as protecting individuals. Arguments continue as to whether the court's decision was a legitimate reading of the amendment or whether it was a politicized interpretation, but that's a different story. And so it is that Magna Carta has echoed down the centuries since that confrontation between King John and his barons in that summer meadow at Runnymede, not far from Windsor Castle, in medieval London in June 1215. And as societies have developed and systems of government have changed, the interpretation and expansion of that one clause have changed to have an impact far beyond the intentions of the original drafters. And indeed, as far as the United States and its Bill of Rights are concerned, the concept of Magna Carta has in some respects been stood on its head. What started in 1215 as a measure to exact protection of the interests of a few, namely the barons, against the demands of one, namely the king, has since 1791 become a protection of the rights and freedoms of the one, the individual, through the courts against the unreasonable use of power by the few, namely the abuse of governmental power by an elected legislative majority or by an overbearing executive. It stood on its head. In 1957, a memorial was erected at Runnymede in England, and it was contributed by the American Bar Association, not by the British, and it says simply, to commemorate Magna Carta, symbol of freedom under law. So it can certainly be said that Magna Carta was at the roots of modern justice here in America, as we know it today. And as Chief Justice Roberts said last November, when a copy of Magna Carta was on display in Washington, DC, quote, Magna Carta embodies the colonists', colonists original aspirations. They were not looking for independence, they were looking for the rights of Englishmen to which they felt they were entitled. Magna Carta lit the fuse for the liberties and freedoms of the individual, as may be seen in the United States Bill of Rights, and it has served ever since as a solid base for, as President Lincoln said so eloquently in his Gettysburg Address in 1863, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Thank you. <laughs>